travelled all over the world with the British Army and with the United Nations. And during his travels, he became interested in the way in which different cultures mark and commemorate people who have died during the course of war. And he's here with us this evening to explore where that initial interest is taken. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for allowing me to come down and speak. I'd like to thank Mike Devereaux for persuading uh, me to come down here. <laughs> okay, this may, I think, at first sight, seem rather like a macabre subject. I don't think, I would hope, it, I can persuade you that it's a matter of uh, some interest. So what I'm going to try and do is, first of all, I'll give you a bit of background about the business of people who died whilst in the camps or associated with the camps or who have been detached from the camps. That immediately raises the subject of numbers and of how, <clears throat> whether we actually know very much about it, whether we can understand the, the scale of what was going on. But really, to bring it home, some of the social history involved and some of the things we can learn, I'd like to look at some examples, in particular, two or three from the First World War, perhaps people who slipped through the net in some way, and then look at some in the Second World War, um, anomalies, oddities, and what they tell us. And then finally, make some very tentative findings, and then room for questions. Please come on, please come I should make it quite clear, I'm probably the first person who's been speaking to this group who hasn't either been a professor or a doctor or had some <laughs> academic background. I am simply an amateur. The reason I'm doing this is it's something that's engaged me, and I found a uh, interesting to look into and I find there were things that came out of it which were relevant to me and I thought relevant to the, the wider world. I think there are things to be learned. And so therefore I haven't approached this in a particular academic way, although I believe this is a subject that is ripe for academic uh, study. So how was my interest first kindled? I don't know if you can read that. That's the Manual of Military Law 1929 reprinted in uh, 1939. In the 1970s, I was on leave, and I was walking down Strand Street. I went into a shop that sold second-hand books, and I found a copy of that. Inside, there was a rubber stamp, and it had come from the Hutchinson camp in Douglas during the Second World War. And in fact, it had the adjutant's name of the camp in the front. It was the, the book which was used for discipline within the camp. What was interesting to me as a soldier was the sections that were thumbed and of which there were marginal notes, were exactly the same sections that were thumbed and marked with marginal notes in my own unit. In other words, here was a camp, here was a group of people in Douglas who were working as a community who had the same problems that we experienced in a community in the military some 30, 40 years later. And it started to get me thinking about the whole business of internment. This is before it became particularly interesting to most people, I think. Then Conry Chappell produced that book, which I think many of you may have seen, which I think raised the, the profile of uh, internment a great deal. And I think there's a certain amount of weariness about internment now because it's all seen as barbed wire and rationing and the Amadeus string quartet and so on. Um, and that's not the aspect I'm going to look at. What I'm looking at is what happened to the community. What happened when people died? How were they? Uh, how did people respond? What was done about it? And then finally, and more recently, the thing that actually kicked me off to do something was a picture we unearthed of this person who is a great uncle of mine. And for the experts amongst you, that uniform is uh, service dress dyed green. Does that signify to anybody? No? The Volunteer Training Corps, the equivalent of Dad's Army in the First World War, he was a member, this is my great uncle Herbert, he was a member of the Loyal Manx, and he's wearing a little badge there, meaning he was a marksman. They were the unpaid 
guys who, once they finished farming, they went out at night and they escorted people off the boats to the camps and looked after, if you like, the second line of all of that. I had no idea that he'd done that. And once I discovered that, I became much more interested in how the camps worked and what was going on. Internment. Does it matter? It's been around a long time. The British probably started something like internment in the Boer War with, under the unfortunate name of concentrating individuals from the Welt in places like Potschopstrom in order to control an irregular force in the Karoo in South Africa. That developed with time and in the First World War, we obviously had the camps here, again in the Second World War. And since then, we have seen internment increase. Uh, in my service, there was Operation Motorman, which was internment in Northern Ireland. This was an internal matter where the idea being to pick up people who were suspected on both sides of the divide in Northern Ireland and take them out of the system and put them into isolation. What, of course, it actually does is create a training camp and a university for terrorists. Not entirely successful, and of course, it is a political hostage to fortune. Increasingly, we've also seen governments around the world increasing the period of time in which they're willing to detain people without trial after charge. And indeed, in the UK, there have been various attempts in the last few years to lengthen the time at which somebody can be arrested before they're brought before courts. Not as successfully, it hasn't increased that much, but it's, it's an ongoing trend. And if you want a practical example of where a sort of internment is going on, Guantanamo Bay is still with us some eight years or so after the American president promised to close it. That's also a form of internment. So internment matters. How you treat people matters. International legislation about it matters. And so therefore, I think this subject is worth looking at. And the final thing that actually made me wonder about how we dealt with things in the Isle of Man was this chap. <clears throat> how old do you think this chap is? He was probably about 15 when the photograph was taken. He was actually 17 when he died. He was listed in the... Commonwealth War Graves Commission uh, section on the Isle of Man civilians, which there are two people, as Holford Glynn. His names were transposed. No detail. I've been looking at uh, how various monuments in the Isle of Man were uh, put together and who was on them and so on. And there was a crash which took place in... Right, just to go through, he's born uh, 24. He, this chap was killed in an accident which crashed in shocking weather conditions in 1942 on the slopes of Snowfall. There were seven crew on board. Two other Air Force personnel died, one from the Royal Canadian Air Force, one from the Royal Air Force, and this chap. He was a trainee with the Met Office. What he'd actually done is in the evening, I think, I suspect, he'd gone along and said, this is a training flight from Litchfield, just doing uh, a loop round to train pilots and navigators. And he'd probably gone along to and say, oh, can I come along with you? I'd like to go for a flight on this and so on. So he was a supernumerary on board. Sadly, um, it, it cost him his life. There's no official record anywhere that I could find of what happened to this chap's body. That's very unusual. If it's a serviceman, there are records it's all written down, it's easy. So I had a look at the records. His body, the cadavers of all three who were killed were taken down to Jerby and kept overnight in Jerby. The commander reported in the casualty report back to the RAF. After that, I think two of the bodies went to mortuary or went for whatever in Douglas. We don't know what happened to that, or we didn't. And this seemed to me strange, so I actually looked into it. The two guys who were, the other two guys who were killed ended up at Jerby, and there are their graves. And there was a piece in a Canadian newspaper about one of them. But as for Glyn Horford, nothing. So 
I decided I'd have, I, having talked to the War Ghost Commission, I then uh, tried, I, I worked out where he came from. It was possible to work out where he'd been born. And I, on spec, I uh, contacted the uh, cemetery authorities in Pontypool and said, is there a record of anybody of this name being buried in Pontypool? And they said, uh, no, but there is, there is a set of graves of a Holford family. And actually, right at this moment, there's an old chap who's, up, who's actually maintaining those and who's actually trying to clean up these graves. And we, we see him from time to time. Would you like to talk to him? And very kindly, they put me in touch with this. And this guy, this is just a strange coincidence, this guy is the brother-in-law of Glyn Horford. He had been married to Glyn Horford's sister, who had died a few years ago. And so having got in touch with him, I think he was probably as surprised and shocked as I was. And he said he was also puzzled about his late wife's brother's grave. As far as he knew, he'd been, he was buried somewhere in the valleys, but he wasn't sure where. But he did say that when this happened, the weather was very bad, and that two members of the family went over to the Isle of Man during the war, a day or two after the accident. They had to wait for a boat. The, the, there was huge problems with weather, and of course there were very few boats. And they collected the body, and the body was taken back and buried properly in where, I guess, other members of the family were buried. I now have a location for that, but we're not sure whether there's a marker. I'm almost certain there must be a gravestone, but it's a defunct church, and I suspect an unmaintained churchyard. But it highlights the difference between the way that the military are dealt with and civilians, and that was the point. So if that was the case with a civilian who died in an RAF aircraft, what was done about the internees? Did anybody take any notice of them? Well, in most cases, if it was necessary, there was an inquest. This is good because the inquest leaves records. You, it's a court. You have uh, plenty to go on. This then went on to burial and hopefully the marking of a grave. Very few were cremated because, of course, in the First World War, cremation was almost unknown, although there was one cremation. And certainly there were no facilities on the Isle of Man to conduct a, a cremation, nor indeed were there in the Second World War. Burial was at the expense, I think, in the First World War of those concerned. I'm not sure that too much was done officially, but I think almost everybody who was involved was buried and it was done properly. Were they war graves? Well, at the time, I don't think that was considered because it's before the advent in the First World War of the War Graves Commission doing its stuff. But after the war, when you look at the schedules, surveys were done, schedules were created of all the people who died, and decisions were made as to whether something should be a war grave or not. And for most of the internees, they were classified as war graves, and therefore came under the aegis of the War Graves Commission, which meant once you're into that, in a sense, you're relatively safe, it's looked after, it's dealt with, it's documented. But if you didn't get into it in the first place, then you're out of the system and you may well have disappeared. Then things started to happen in the 1950s and 60s. In the 1950s, uh, an agreement was signed between the West German government and the British government about Germans who had died in the UK during both world wars. There was a move to open a brand new cemetery in Cannock, uh, on Cannock Chase, quite close to an existing British military cemetery and to concentrate all of the bodies, all the remains from the whole of the British Isles, if they could, into this one cemetery. It's an ambitious plan. The idea was the Germans would pay, it would be done by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and this would be put pay to this huge problem of maintaining hundreds, if not thousands, of graves all over the UK. The process started in the early 60s, and it reached the Isle of Man, which was a major site for such work in 1962. Before I did this, I had no knowledge of exhumation. And I don't, do we have any clergymen here? In order to exhume a body, as I'm sure you've all had to do, 
you have, to go to, you have to go to the consistory court and get what is known as a faculty. That's to say uh, 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 an order, a judgment by a, a, a church court. And these are very precise documents. They say you can take so, you can take these people out of there, and you must do it between these dates, and it has to be done properly and according to um, particular rules. So there was a degree of argument. And during that, the, what was then described as the Hebrew, Hebrew congregation in the Isle of Man, that is to say the, the, the Jewish organization in the Isle of Man, put in a formal objection to the movement of any Jewish remains. And that was respected. Uh, there were also quite a lot of toings and froings uh, in order to do this. So eventually it happened. Now this is one, this is the major business of moving bodies from one place to another. As you can see, even though it's only dealing with well, I say only, 245 bodies. This was done over a very short period. Can you imagine what it is like to have a team of people going in and unearthing human remains, which are anything up to 40 or 50 years old? You have to be sure that you have the right grave, that you have got the complete human remains, and you have to treat them with respect, and you have to move them correctly, and they have to be reinterred in the far end. This is a huge undertaking and a difficult undertaking. As you can see, they're spread around. And as, if you, like me, are obsessive about adding up numbers when people like me put things onto tables like that, you will notice there are a number of mathematical anomalies in that table. They're not mistakes. In reality, when they came to do it, there were anomalies in terms of who was where and what they were picking up, as I understand it. But again, I have never talked to anybody who's directly involved, only people who are indirectly involved. However, they did a pretty good job. And the bodies were taken to this place, which is the German military cemetery in Cannock. And if you're ever driving through the Midlands and you have an hour or two, I, I would recommend going and have a look at it. Like most of the it's a beautiful place, but it's also an extraordinarily interesting place. As you can see, the figure that they give is kind of chalked in because they're always adding to it. There are always changes going on as people are found and so on. There are 2,143 when I took that photograph about 10 years ago. And 2,780 something in the Second World War. It's big. And unlike ours, they use a dark stone, and each of these stones represents four dead Germans or Austrians or Austro-Hungarians, or I suspect some Bulgarians. Two names on each side of the stone. And it is the custom of the, their authorities only to put on the name, the rank, and the date of death. Occasionally, the, the uh, date of birth is on there as well. But there's very little information indeed goes on to these stones. And the names will be put on according to German transliteration of the names. This matters because if you're an Austro-Hungarian, you could be Serb, you could be anything. But occasionally there are, when you start to compare the names as they were known here during internment, they will not necessarily be the same as the names that are here there will be a degree of, of change. And you have to look at the documents to find this out. Oops, one thing. In addition to the, uh, the exhumations by, uh, of Germans, there was also a few, uh, there was one Dutch exhumation done here. There are two Italians who were moved. They went to Brookwood to the large military cemetery at Brookwood Villas, an Italian section. And I think there have been occasional exhumations of private individuals where the family has claimed, I think particularly from North Wales, where the large um, Italian communities have claimed some of their relatives to add to their own family graves in various places around. So it's not been a static thing. 
if we take a further example of, we just looked at those uh, figures from Patrick. Perhaps it's worth looking at Patrick. This is an aerial view taken from Google of Patrick uh, Churchyard. This is the, the new kind of square, beautifully taken off. This is an older churchyard, which is higgledy-piggledy, if this matters. You will notice immediately that down here, there's an area with very few stones and a lot of dents. That's where the exhumations took place. Uh, there were, that's where the vast majority had been buried. Um, one of the things I tried to do was to reconcile the figures from here with the figures that went to Canuck and so on. And oddly, there were no definitive lists of these things. You had to kind of reconstruct them to work out who was who. We knew who'd gone into each grave, but who they were. Not. What comes out of it is that they were buried in blocks according to whether they were Austro-Hungarian, whether they were German. And then occasionally, individuals elected or their relatives elected to be buried here in the old section. Now, primarily this was Jewish graves, but there are one or two, I suspect, maybe minority Protestant sects or something, but there, are, there must be reasons why people were buried here, because there were some Christian burials there. What is left now is the British military burials, which are mostly members of the staff of the internment camp who died on duty, and of course a vast blank area with nothing at all. However, if you had gone back round about 1917, 1980, what you would have seen, oh right, sorry, this is just, that's just the layout of the, the numbers. And as you can see, this is the area which was devoted to, this is what you would have seen. That is the same area, and as you can see, the internees had actually laid this thing out with these stones resting, detailed stones, a lot of text. I have pondered over these photographs, trying to decipher what the text is on these. Some success, and also going cross -eyed. It's, um, and that's the sort of, if you like, that's the equivalent of the picture I showed you two ago. That's what it used to look like. And then eventually those recumbent stones were erected properly. And so from the end of the uh, First World War until 1962, that's what Patrick Churchyard looked like. And what is interesting, some of these stones said, ship's captain so-and-so, member of this, did this, did that. They were quite elaborate. They were of a unified design. They had put a lot of thought and time into it. After all, they probably had that time to think about these things. It, it was a great job. They were, they were very substantial things. When uh, the business of exhumation happened, what do you do with the gravestones? Vast quantity of very high quality stones here. Um, must have been tempting to turn them into flagstones or do something like that, but you can't. So as far as I know, these stones were broken up and they've disappeared. And what is very sad, I, I haven't come across anywhere yet that has a record of what was written on these stones. I find that extraordinary. I thought somewhere somebody would have gone along and photographed or recorded what was written on the stones. So there's information here about the lives of these people, often telling you why they were there, in effect. And yet that has gone missing. We don't have that information. Because all that happened when these people were transferred is they went into those black gravestone marked graves with their name, their rank, and the date they died. You notice I say here two or three German Jewish war graves. When I did a comparison of the numbers, I had a discrepancy of one on these. Now, most of you will have seen, or anybody who's interested in this will have seen this. These are the two uh, war graves with the Star of David in the churchyard at Patrick. In my view, there should be a third one for a man called Bela Polak. Now, I believe he was Jewish, but I, I'm not entirely certain. But there's certainly the remains of somebody else. There is no stone, and he's not on the record. And yet, he was there, and he wasn't transferred. When I asked the questions about this, I was told, and this comes down to the heart of the matter, they could only transfer people if they were absolutely certain they had 
the right remains, and that the remains were, I guess, fairly complete. And in this particular section, they could not do that. It was not possible. These weren't going to be removed anyway because they were Jewish and they were already marked. It is possible that the third uh, grave had a stone, and the stone, these aren't the original sites, the third stone may have been damaged or may have been lost. I don't know. And then finally, there is the, there's this, which is the a Turkish wall grave, which has the seven Muslim graves, uh, I think maintained by the Wall Grave Commission, but certainly visited every so often by an official from the Turkish embassy. And these are uh, uh, Ottoman um, citizens who were in Nokelo and who died. So pretty exotic, frankly. Patrick Churchard has a lot of stories to tell. It, there are a lot of interesting people who were buried and who were moved. There's a lot going on there. Okay, let's move on uh, and talk about individuals. Cases. I remember I said I was going to talk about a couple of cases in the First World War. This chap here, Frederick Charles Brandauer, was a kind of minor Branson of his time. He was an entrepreneur. He'd come from Vienna with his father. They started, they'd been manufacturers in Vienna, and they started a branch in London, and they manufactured pen nibs. Not you would have thought a fast seller and a big item, but of course, in the 19th century, early 20th century, a huge thing. They made them, they made a pretty good product. They sold them in large numbers around the British Empire. Enough for him, before the war, to be riding around in a Lanchester. This is him with a hat. And um, it was a good business. He had very high-ranking relatives, including a German general. And uh, I think his sister was married to a German general, who seems to be been a fairly stiff Prussian. Um, but he, he'd gone back across there. He'd gone backwards and forwards. He was eventually naturalized in the UK, around about the 1890s, I think. And his papers were signed by Earl Grey, uh, who was at the time the uh, foreign secretary, but is also, I think, the tea man, is he not? Um, unfortunately, he went back and he then in some way seems to have lost that naturalization or renounced it or something, maybe under the influence of his family. We do not know. But when he, the war came along, he was now once again simply a German citizen. So he was arrested. Uh, he went to Alexandra Palace, and then he was eventually sent to the Isle of Man. His business in Birmingham was confiscated, but he was a wealthy man. When he came to the Isle of Man, he became what was known as a privileged prisoner. He was able to pay his, for his own servant. He was able to pay for extra accommodation. So he lived in an extra set of rooms in Douglas. He had a manservant who was paid for. He was disabled. He had a problem. I think he was deaf. He also had other problems as well. He was relatively young. Sorry, I thought it was a comment. Um, <laughs> towards the end of the war, it became apparent that there was going to be uh, an attempt to send most of the internees back to their country of origin. Out of the many thousands of internees all over the UK and elsewhere, only 3,000 were given permission to remain. And that meant the vast majority would go back. He petitioned everybody he could to stay. And finally, he was turned down about three or four days before he was due to be shipped off to Spalding, which is the sorting center for those who were to be sent back to Germany. He'd already told the camp doctor that the only way he was going back to Germany was in a wooden box. The camp commandant in Douglas had put him under what we would now call suicide watch. But he was a clever man. He had actually kept with him, since before he was interned in the Isle of Man, um, some Veronal tablets, which is a narcotic. And he retired to bed 5.30 one evening, took the Veronal, and his manservant discovered him dead the following morning, which is a couple of days before he was due to leave the island. He left a suicide note, which 
I won't read because I'm running short of time, but essentially it's very touching and it's very careful to say that he didn't blame anybody for his suicide, but that he could not face going back to Germany and he left bequests to his house staff. He had two houses, one in Maidenhead, one somewhere else, which were fully staffed. He left money to them. He also left uh, 100 pounds a year to his housekeeper for the maintenance of his dog as long as it will live. His instruction was to be cremated, which is very unusual and that there was to be only one thing done at his funeral, and that was the Lord's Prayer. There was to be nothing else done at his funeral. And so far as we know, I guess, but in a way, it's done probably Liverpool, certainly couldn't have been done here. Um, there's a sequel to this, which is quite strange, and I don't know what it tells us exactly. i leave that for you, but... Um, Three days later, after he'd committed suicide, Frederick Schramm, 54, a German in Hansworth, was discovered, this was on May 1917, in a bedroom shot through the head. A revolver was by his side. Schramm, who was a naturalized Briton, had lived in England for 35 years. He was in charge of Brandauer's foreign business interests. He was very upset at Brandauer's suicide at Douglas Alien Camp. He had been greatly attached to him and corresponded with him throughout the war. And so, two suicides. And that raises the question of suicide and mental health. So there are instances of internees deliberately eating poisonous plants to commit suicide. Um, later, in the Second World War, people jumped off the roof or the, uh, the leads on top of some of the guest houses into the area down below, which would be, you know how big these houses are, particularly ones in um, Ramsey. Obviously, that's fatal. And I think one has to remember that if you were a refugee coming from Europe, you were sent to the Isle of Man, particularly in the Second World early on, let's say you were a Jewish refugee, as much as we may see this as a safe haven, as a sanctuary, I think it's possible to a lot of people this was seen as being penned up and had Britain fallen, there would have been packages, camps full of people ready to be delivered to Hitler and all that could happen. So although it's hard to understand, although one might instinctively say they should have been quite relaxed about certain things, I suspect deep down that was not the case. There was a lot of fear about what could happen if things went wrong in the UK. And it was probably not until quite well into the war that people started to come to terms with that. Okay, that's just a bit of a friend. But just to show that Brandauer's is still in business and still has royal patronage. The company is still there, still doing pressings. This time it's making very high quality pressings for things like uh, space vehicles and for all manner of very high quality, high tech. This chap here, I'm going to have to be fairly quick with Nick. This is a chap much younger. Died of uh, tuberculosis in 1919. Does anybody know what that is from? Did anybody go to that school? No? That's Clifton College at Bristol. This guy was the son of a German naval officer. That German naval officer happened to end up in the First World War as head of German naval intelligence. He must have been of interest to somebody, this guy, you think. The guy also, his father also, during the First World War, for part of the time, commanded the southern flotilla of the German uh, high seas fleet that was operating in the English Channel. And he took part and commanded the task force that attacked Hartlepool and various towns from the coast. I don't know if anybody knows there was uh, uh, quite a lot of damage done to Scarborough and various other places in those attacks. That was his dad. Meanwhile, his son was in a camp in Douglas, 
How much of this was known, I don't know. He stayed at school until he was, uh, till he reached, I think, his 18th birthday. He was then shipped to the Isle of Man, and he was made the responsibility of the headmaster of Clifton College. When he died, he actually left his money to the uh, headmaster. And in the records, I found that shortly after going to school, age 13, he contributed five shillings to the British Antarctic Expedition for Captain Scott's mission. Not too surprising because the German intelligence system was being built up. I think a lot of them were trained in the UK, and I suspect that his dad was an Anglophile. That is until he presumably raised his guns on Hartlepool. <laughs> his grave is within about three minutes' walk of where we are now, very close to the crematorium, in perpetual care, he wasn't exhumed. Don't know why. Maybe because he was in perpetual care. Maybe that is that grave is already marked and known. The family may have been contacted. And there he is. There's nothing to tell you on that who he was. But what is interesting is that's an official German war grave. Listed by them in Germany. Nothing on it to tell you that at all. But it is. Okay, another rather sad case. Emmerich Barach, I'm going to have to be quick because I, I realize we are running out of time. I've already mentioned mental health. Everybody's heard of shell shock, post traumatic stress disorder, that thing. What happened in the First World War? Well, if you were in, this is a, an Austrian <coughs> civilian and who obviously had mental health issues. He was sent from the Isle of Man to what was then the biggest asylum in the UK, which was the Whittingham Hospital just outside Preston. We don't know when he was born. And all we know is that he died of colitis complications on the 5th of June, 1917. That is Whittingham in its heyday. It is a town. It's like all these big uh, institutions, rural, its own farm, its own laundry, its own railway, all of that. And up towards the top there is a graveyard. This is the plan. And uh, he is buried in the cemeteries. Actually, we think buried somewhere round about there. All that remains of this at the moment is a unit down here, which is actually a new unit, and that. The rest of it has been cleared, and there's a lot of building going on in the works. And sooner or later, they will build right up to the cemetery. I've looked for documents. There are some documents, but although, and this is what the cemetery now looks at, there are no stones, there's no marker. People who, the, the British military are buried here, there are official war graves here with Portland stone markers. But this guy has no marker, no reference, no nothing. And yet, as far as I can tell, it is a war grave, and it does come under the general rule of these things. But again, there was no exhumation because they could not identify precisely which grave was which and where he would have been. And so therefore, yes, you could dig up here and I guess you will find the remains of somebody, but you have no idea who they are. And this is sadly the case, I believe, in many mental hospitals that quite often there was just a numbered stone put where graves went. Later, here, there are bigger stones, but even so, right up until the end, they were very, very small markers. Near where he was, there was this, but the rest it was mostly, there was very little. Okay, moving to the Second World War quickly. John Reginald Ortner, big name, very, very small. Possibly the youngest of the internees to be exhumed and transferred to Canada. This is a very, very sensitive issue, I'm guessing. If you look at the German registers, he doesn't appear. There's no reference. If you look at their lists, this child is not on that list. He was born to um, an internee in the south of the island, and he's buried. Uh, he was originally buried in the churchyard at Russian, the parish church. There are about eight or nine burials there, only one remains, because I guess there was some reason why that was not an exhumation. That's the one that remains. The rest are empty. 
that's in the right hand corner as you go in. On the other hand, when you go to Canuck, here he is. But he's not listed. And I think this is a kind of modern embarrassment by the German authorities that they sh could have exhumed an infant. And I think it's a sensitive matter for them. Interesting enough, the Wargraves Commission, British Wargraves, does list this particular person. Okay, final thing. Now move up to Lazare. Sorry. We moved to Lazare. A year ago, I went into Lazare churchyard and I saw this. I knew from the lists that um, there was a reserve plot, as it's called. Is this thing here? Actually, it's the half of that. It's just that bit there. Which was used to bury those who died in the Mur um, internment camp. I was a bit surprised to see there are no stones. Now, I knew that two Italians who'd been there had been uh, lifted and taken to Brookwood. So I knew there'd be two blanks, but nothing at all. This, that, that, grave is, that grave there is not connected. It actually faces the other way. So the two Italians, and I knew that one of the Italians had been very popular in the camp, and the accounts explained that everybody saved up odd bits of stone, odd bits of masonry, and that a works party was given permission to go to Lazare and make a really good gravestone. And I think, being Italians, one can imagine a lot of workmanship, and I imagine that there was something fairly spectacular there until the exhumation. The exhumation was in 1967, well within living memory. If you go to um, Brookwood, this is what you see. And confusingly, the two Italians have very, very similar names, although they're not in any way connected with each other. And by the way, if you ever see war graves, that little notch there indicates that these are civilians. And the hump at the top there, you, the white Portland stone markers are not all the same. And the shape is crucial. crucial. It will tell you a lot about what that particular grave is. If it's got a very humpy top, it means that it's paid for by the family. Why they should do that? Um, right. A few minutes of life, half an hour or so after I'd been there, that plot then looked like this because I had noticed what I thought originally were two drains here. But when I examined them, they were pieces of peel sandstone, substantial, and they're actually recumbent gravestones. That's how they were meant to be. They're flush with the ground. And very gingerly, I start to peel off the, the ground cover. I hope there's nobody from the authorities here. <laughs> I, have, I feel no guilt about it, I have to tell you. But on the other hand, it, I might have been polite to tell them, but I didn't. I have told somebody since. And what I found was this. I found two gravestones. Marty Vallon, born in Pori in Finland, and died in uh, 1943. Now, he was a seaman. I know very little about him, but I think his death was fairly routine and probably heart condition attacking. Then there's this. And some of you, I think, will know about this. Nestor <coughs> Hooperman, he was. He was killed with a knife. He was stabbed by a man called Salmanin, another the Finnish sailor. The basic reason for this was an argument between the two factions within the Finnish community, one that was pro-Russia, one that was pro-German, and difficulties about how they should conduct themselves. They'd also been given a beer ration and then broken into a beer store. They'd all made themselves knives and bits and pieces. They were a little unsavory and in disciplinary terms a nightmare, as far as I can see. But nonetheless, it was a nasty business. Summonen was arrested and he was tried in Douglas in front of Deemster Cowley and a jury. The trial was held in camera, and the jury was sworn to secrecy. And the details of the trial were not revealed until after the war. 
Salmanen was charged with murder, but in his summing up, Cowley gave three options to the jury, murder, manslaughter, or if you think this was legitimate self-defense, acquittal. The jury considered that Salmanen had acted in legitimate self-defense, so he was acquitted. What happened to Salmanen? Obviously, he's not made there. Um, Salmanen was then taken under escort, put on a boat, and was last seen going into um, sailors' accommodation or the white MCA um, on his way who knows where. And nothing was ever heard of him again. We don't know it, 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 why that was covered up, I don't know. I suspect just over time that grave had been neglected. There are no family, and it's in perfectly good condition. And I haven't been up to it for a few months, but I suspect it's still quite visible if you want to go up and pay your respect. There it is. OK, so where does that leave us? That leaves us with one more grave. Now, there's a German war grave in Lusaire, and it's this one. I can't find any marker there. I, I'm not in the habit of digging these things up. Maybe there's something <laughs> down there. I would be in enough trouble anyway. But um, I could find nothing. And it's this guy here. A chap called um, Anton. Uh, let's get the name. Oh, or Anthony. Interesting guy. He was born in Baltimore in the United States. Son of a German tram driver. I can see no evidence that he ever went to Germany. He came to the UK around about early 1900s, married a British lass in, uh, I think, Finchley or somewhere, in 1910, and didn't get British nationality. This is 1910. Didn't get British nationality. So, of course, at the beginning of the... First World War, he was interned, and he was interned for the duration of the First World War. He clearly didn't take the hint. He raised a family, but he still had German nationality, although as far as one can tell, he'd never been there. And so at the outbreak of the Second World War, come with us, Alexander Palace, whatever, and he was sent to the Isle of Man. Sadly, he died of, I think, again, heart problems in, uh, when he was 56 here on the Isle of Man at the Moor camp. He's in a German war grave. I, I wonder whether he actually spoke particularly good German. Undoubtedly, he will have considerable numbers of relatives and so on still in the UK. I don't know whether they know this or not. OK, very quickly, the findings. I think I've more or less rounded down your throats already. But this seems to me to be something I want to look into more, because this is to do, there clearly was, it seems to me, more cases of suicide than you would expect. And people weren't maltreated, as far as I can tell. This was just the effect of what was happening to them. They seem to have been pretty well looked after. Certainly the medical provision seems to have been good. But even so, being kept under those conditions and with the stress that was underlying everything, there was quite a lot of illness. Records. I was talking to Katrina earlier. There are many sources, some of which are very valuable, like the Red Cross in Geneva has started to release its records. Most of the First World War ones are now released. Come with all newspapers, private and public papers. There, there are lots of records. There are also lots of gaps in the records. And we know here in the Isle of Man that large numbers of records were destroyed, uh, although not elsewhere in the UK. Burials, I haven't been able to account for everybody. There are still queries, things I'm still looking into. And not all the graves are properly marked, which is something I find quite hard to understand. More research? I think so. We know less than we might expect. There's scope for any one of you. I'm not a professional. Anybody who's interested, if you want to go and have a look at this stuff, please do. It, it is, it's interesting. It's social history. It's military history. 
it's about people, it is generally fairly interesting stuff. It's work in progress.